Nir Lav is a physicist from Bar Ilan University in Israel. His work focuses on network theory, nonlinear dynamics, and chaos theory with applications for neuroscience. Collaborating with Zachariah Nima, his 2022 paper was chosen as one of the most influential articles of the year by Neuroscience News. We will discuss that paper titled A Relativistic Theory of Consciousness. To support this channel, please like and subscribe, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Mir, thanks for coming on the program. Hi, thank you very much, Carlos. It's uh, great to be here. Yes, I'm uh, very excited for this conversation, and I'm sure uh, folks, once they've heard, I gave, just did like a brief introduction for you. Once they hear that, they'll be uh, enticed to, to watch and listen to our, our full conversation. But uh, before we dive into the main topic here, uh, your paper, A Relativistic Theory of Consciousness, do you mind uh, giving the audience a bit of uh, some background on yourself and how you found your way to physics? Yeah, actually, um, uh, when I was very little, I understood that I want to, uh, to be a physicist. Uh, the, the story goes, actually, that even in, in the uh, kindergarten, uh, one day the, the teacher there um, asked everybody to go inside, uh, inside or something like that, and she see me digging outside in the uh, sand or something, and she asked me, uh, Neil, what are you doing? Why don't you come inside? And I told her that I uh, want to find gravity. <laughs> <laughs> so in my mind, I had this picture of Earth and in the middle of the Earth, like a huge magnet. Mm. And I wanted to dig and find the magnet. You know? so, Gosh, <laughs> that's awesome. But, <laughs> <laughs> and then in the third uh, grade, I think, I found a book about Albert Einstein. And over there, I read that uh, if somehow we can pass, uh, we can move uh, faster than the speed of light, then we will actually move backwards in time. So we will move to the past mm -hmm. or something like that. And nowadays, I know that, I mean, it, it's, it's true, but not true. It's not exactly, it's more complex than that. But back then, when I read it, it was amazing. Um, for me, it was like like I took the the red pill in the matrix. Uh, all of a sudden, there was something interesting <laughs> in the mm. world, uh, like all these sci-fi movies about uh, uh, time machines. It's actually a true thing. Sure. And then I realized that. I have to create a time machine, <laughs> and for that I need to uh, to be a physicist. <laughs> gotcha. So then, then I uh, decided that I will uh, I will go to learn physics <laughs> yeah. in That's the third cool. grade. Awesome. Yeah. Now, how did that start to uh, fast forwarding to I guess recent right. past, uh, <laughs> you know, undergrad, grad school? What? Um, how did you then? What, what made you interested in neuroscience? I mean, this is the sort of, I think, one of the interesting uh, things about your work is that you're interdisciplinary here. So how did neuro become a um, core focus for you? Yeah, right. So, I mean, you're right. In the end, I didn't create a time machine, right? So oh, we no. talked about that. <laughs> and neuroscience. Well, it's not about neuroscience per se. It's more about... Uh, at some point, I, I understood that we have uh, that it, we don't see reality as it is. Uh, we want to know what reality is, what is the truth, right? Like the name of your podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, in order to do that, uh, we need to find some clues um, from nature, what is going on here. And those clues usually it, it usually means that we need to find. A, um, a phenomenon or phenomena that we cannot explain, that are just very weird and bizarre, but still, still true. We can still uh, prove that uh, that this is, you know, the situation uh, in, in the lab. Uh, and then we we need to understand what is going on here, and this is how we can uh, uh, we can see uh, more and more uh, into into the depth of nature, let's uh, say, of the depth of reality. It's a bit like in a uh, Plato cave analogy. Sure. We are inside the cave, we see only the shadows, and we try to go out of the cave. So to go out from the illusion, 
to see reality as it is. And then, so, okay, so then I tried to, um, to check for those very mysterious, interesting uh, phenomena uh, that we know of. So you can think about the quantum measurement problem or black holes, but also about consciousness. Consciousness, it's, uh, it has uh, a, a, a mysterious uh, um, a part, aspect that we don't know how to solve. Um, and that's why I, you know, I, I was drawn, let's say, into neuroscience in order to understand what consciousness is. And then I realized that neuroscience alone cannot really solve uh, this mysterious part, the hard problem of consciousness. And we need, we need physics for that. Right, gotcha. And I think that's a great segue, actually, if you wouldn't mind uh, the main focus of this conversation, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving the audience an, an overview of your paper titled uh, Relativistic Theory of Consciousness. Uh, can you give us this like, broad level, you know, high level summary, and then we're gonna, we're gonna dive into some details. Okay, I mean, yeah, we need to dive to what is consciousness at all and everything, but- Sure, yeah, define, yeah, absolutely. Right, but uh, I, I would say that um, the idea is that consciousness now is not absolute anymore. It's a relativistic phenomenon, which means that now it depends on the observers. Uh, each of us is a different observer, uh, and we um, and then consciousness de consciousness depends on the measurements that we can create, and then some measurements uh, create a, a physical property that we call it consciousness. But then other measurements will create other properties. Uh, the one that we used to let's say. Uh, what we call like a neurons and, and, and the potentials, uh, neuron firings and all these dynamics. So we have like two equivalent descriptions of the same underlying reality. This is in a nutshell, the theory. <laughs> but you know, but, but I guess it doesn't say a lot. I, we need to go, you know, to dive in in order to understand yeah. uh, what does it mean exactly. Absolutely. I think, yeah, it's hard. It's a hard thing to, uh, to, to wrap up in one little bow here. But I do think, um, I guess perhaps we could start off with the, even the name of the paper and what you bring in. Uh, of course, you're uh, tying it up with Einstein's theory of relativity. So perhaps that's a good, that's a good place to start off as sort of um, a jumping off point here. How do you use Einstein's theories of relativity? Are they used as, a, as an analogy in your model? Or is there actually an explanatory link between that idea and this concept that you're putting forth? Yeah, this is a great question. Is it just analogy or not? Okay, so two things here. First of all, um, one very important um, issue here is that this theory is not about a special rel uh, theory of relativity or general theory of relativity. It's not about that. It's not about space and time and velocity and uh, gravity. Uh, consciousness is a completely different phenomenon. But there's something, there's something else here. Uh, so Einstein's uh, theory of relativity and also Galilean theory for mm. relativity, both of those um, concepts, let's call it, or both of those theories, they rely on the same basic principle. Uh, there is a, a principle in physics that uh, we call it the relativistic principle. And this is what I use. I use the relativistic principle. And then I try to show that consciousness is a relativistic phenomenon. It, it means that it's not only an analogy, you know, it's, uh, it's the, what I, try to show, or let's say it's an assumption. The assumption here is that consciousness is, is a, a real physical phenomenon and it's relative. And then it, mean, it, it, it means that it needs to, uh, to, um, to have some conditions, to meet some conditions uh, in order to be relativistic phenomenon. Uh, and I try to show in the paper that indeed consciousness 
uh, uh, meets these conditions. And because of that, it is the relativistic phenomenon and the physical uh, phenomenon, right? So first of all, I guess we need to uh, ask ourselves, what is the relativistic principle then? Yes, right? I love, that's, my, that's one of the questions I had because you do, and you just dropped it too, the idea that there's Einsteinian relativity, Galilean relativity, and then I don't even know what's considered uh, par for the course relativity today in terms of how that's evolved since Einstein's time. But maybe you give us a little bit of background between those. What are, what are the differences and where are we today with relativity? Okay, right. Yeah, so I think Galileo was the first one that uh, noticed that um, there are some uh, phenomena that are relative uh, and not absolute. And actually he, he spoke about uh, velocity. So velocity uh, is, uh, and also position, I would say, uh, those uh, physical properties are not absolute in the sense that when you ask different uh, observers uh, what, what is your velocity, for example, or what is the velocity of a different object, they will say uh, different answers. And you cannot distinguish, you cannot say, ah, uh, this, ob this observer is right and the other is wrong. The answer uh, uh, depends on the observer, actually, the measurements of the observer. So for example, let's say, so this is the example from Galilean relativity. Uh, let's say that you are um, on a moving train and the train moves in a constant velocity and I'm outside of the train on the platform. Uh, all the experiments that you can do inside the train will show you that you are actually at rest. So all the results will, will be the same uh, as exactly if you were outside at rest. For example, you can take a, a, a ball in your hand and you can throw it up in, in, into the air. And because uh, of uh, momentum, uh, it will go back to your hand actually, mm -hmm. just exactly if you are just outside of the train. So, you, so this is like one example, how come you cannot distinguish uh, if you are in a constant velocity or at rest, right? So, so this is something that, uh, that uh, Galileo understood already back in, what was it, like 400 years ago. Yeah. Um, and th so this is the first concept, let's say, of, of relativity. But then in the 19th century, um, the uh, you know a uh, physicist uh, discovered uh, the uh, light and the uh, and the light waves and how and the dynamics of of the light wave and then Maxwell came and created the three equations to describe the electromagnetic uh, waves uh, and we understood that these waves are actually light. And everything was great, but then there was a problem with that. Uh, they saw that, uh, so Galileo created a transformation, how you can transform from one observer, one frame of reference to another observer, another frame of reference. For example, uh, we start from you on the train. So we are in your frame of reference. In your frame of reference, you will say that you have uh, velocity, uh, you have no velocity, but I and all the world moves backwards, right? And then we can, we can use Galileo uh, equations in order to make this transformation from your frame of reference to mine on the platform. And then uh, according to the transformation, we will see that, yeah, indeed, I will say that I'm at rest and you're the one that moves. So these transformations works uh, very well for the usual world that we know, uh, like trains and, and uh, airplanes and whatever. But it didn't work for uh, light waves, for electromagnetic waves. And then Einstein ca uh, uh, came and showed that we need a new kind of transformation, uh, what we call today the Lorentz transformation. So actually Lorentz, uh, it did it uh, 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 a couple of years before Einstein, but uh, he didn't re he didn't understand the full meaning, let's say, of this transformation. And Einstein uh, understood it and created a, 
special uh, theory of relativity. And, uh, and over there, uh, what he showed is that we cannot, um, we need to take together space and time. And now we need to, 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 to speak about space time as a mm -hmm. one thing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, time is like the, it's, it's the fourth dimension of, uh, of space, if you like. And then he continues uh, after 10 years. So this was in 1905. And then 10 years after, in 1916, if I remember correctly, he uh, created a general relativity. Uh, over there, he explained uh, also what is the gravity. Um, uh, so it's, it, it all came from the relativistic principle um, which actually I didn't tell you still what it is. <laughs> uh, the relativistic principle means that uh, there's nothing above and beyond the observers, that, uh, 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 you know, the physical properties are not absolute anymore and they depend on the observers. So even if we have two different systems, but if those two observers, um, all of their experiments, all the results of their experiments are the same, then we cannot distinguish between them physically. So it means that uh, this, they are equivalent. So they have the same laws of physics uh, on those two systems, the same phenomena in the two systems, and they are just equivalent. Um, so if we go back to uh, the example on the train, um, we cannot distinguish from a physical point of view, we cannot distinguish between you on the on the moving train and between me outside. Uh, we cannot distinguish because we you will measure the same results as I do. And because of that, we have the same uh, laws of physics and uh, we are equivalent. Um, so this is the relativistic principle. And now the question is, uh, is it true for all nature, for all physical properties are only for some properties. So for now, we talked about velocity, constant velocity even. And Einstein showed that it's also true for space and time. Uh, but what about other properties? So even today, we know that it's not true for acceleration. Acceleration seems to be absolute property. Something mm -hmm. that it doesn't really matter what you will observe. We will always see the same, uh, um, or let's say uh, you will have different laws of uh, nature than people that are not uh, under acceleration. You will see, let's say that the train now is under acceleration and you do the same experiment. You take a ball right. in your hand and you throw it in the air, like <laughs> upwards. Now, but because now there is a, 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 the train and you are accelerating and the ball now is in the air, it does not accelerate. So from your point of view, what you will see is that the ball actually goes beyond, uh, goes uh, to the back of the train. Mm. So you will say, oh, wait, something is weird here. There is a new force, some force that you know, takes the ball to, to the back of me. Uh, so what is going on here? And because of that, now you know that you are not uh, a, a under, you are not at rest anymore. There's something mm. uh, different here because of mm. those inertial forces. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. And because of that now, uh, acceleration is not like constant velocity. And we can distinguish between uh, those two observer, one under acceleration right, and right. one is not under acceleration, right? So the relativistic principle here is is wrong. Okay, so 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 you see, it depends now. What is uh, what are we talking about? Which physical property are we talking about? So until today, there is it's a, like an open mm -hmm. question about the relativistic principle. How universal is it? And that's uh, I guess an open question. What are I mean, you just had me interested in this? If acceleration is one absolute property, what are, can you give us any examples of other ones that are absolute? Mm. <laughs> um, well, as far as I know, yeah. So 
according to Einstein, yeah, uh, 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 gravity is not really a force. Gravity right. is a curvature of space time. And now the interesting part about it is that, you know, it's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit complicated, but uh, when you locally, you will not measure that you have any gravitation, let's say, only you will not measure that you have a curved space time. It's something that you can measure globally if you, if you measure far away from you. But then this measurement about the curvature of space time, it seems that it's a, 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 an absolute measurement that even if you uh, make a transformation to a different observer, and this observer also will try to measure the same uh, uh, global measurement that you did, all of them will measure the curvature of space time. So it seems that this is also an absolute property. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that little diversion, but just was uh, right. intrigued yeah. by it. So, yeah, so we have these relativistic principle. We have this relativistic principle that you're working with, and this is pretty core to your theory here. And you know what? Have, yeah. You know what? Yeah, there mm -hmm. is something uh, you asked me about today, about what is going on in these days. And there is something interesting. So it's, it's very controversial. It's on the edge, let's uh, let's say, nice. of physics. I like I like it already. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, quantum mechanics is so weird, right? It is, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and nobody knows uh, what exactly is going on with the quantum measurement problem. How come uh, uh, without the measurement, we the particle will be in superposition, but then after the measurement. Uh, all of a sudden, we will measure one value, right? The, the, the superposition will collapse and the particle will be in one position or will have a specific value of, uh, let's say, spin or any physical property that you like. Mm -hmm. So now it's beyond uh, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics that does not uh, give a description of the measurement itself. And then there are a couple of uh, interpretations. Uh, one of those interpretation, uh, one of those interpretation is uh, the relational quantum mechanics by Carlo Rovelli, mm. and over there, what he tr what he tries to say, is, and it's from the nineties, if I remember correctly, what he tried to say there is that uh, physical properties are relational, and relational, it's I, I would say it's the next step after relativity. Not only that uh, now that properties are relative to the observer, now in order to actually to measure the property, the physical property, you need some relations. You need, again, it's all about measurement and uh, you measure some relations. And because of that, all of a sudden now you'll have, let's say a spin. Uh, or uh, one position for the for the particle. So for me, uh, it's um, for me it's pretty obvious that quantum mechanics, in the end of the day, it's a relativistic uh, should be a relativistic theory uh, mm. uh, and uh, and relational theory. You know, mm. so but but it's still something you know it's it's still very controversial and uh, but I think this is where where we are we are going. Oh, Ask me again in 50 years. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll set the date. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because I just read, I just finished a couple months ago uh, one of his books, something about time. I can't remember the, the title. That's a small black book and uh, very interesting stuff yeah. in there. I kind of want to, it's actually his potential thing I might cover in the future. He has a quote called, uh, he equates time to being ignorance. Like time is ignorance, which I think it has to do with like predictive quality of like what's to come, you know? Um, but I have to unpack that more. I didn't really get, um, I couldn't really fully grok that from what he has in the book, but I have to think about that a bit more and, and kind of revisit. So, right. cool. So we're, so we're setting up the, the stage here, I think, um, pretty well. And thank you so much for those examples. I'd love to talk about the Lorentz transformation perhaps in a little bit, just because that's it starts to get pretty technical pretty quickly. Um, so I think actually when we're talking about in terms of relativity, um, 
where this, I think, merges back to the, or comes from the paper, is with your concept around like Chalmers' uh, philosophical zombies. And this idea, the equivalence principle, um, do you agree that's a good place to go next? I think I think that that just you've you've, you've set up some stuff. But if there's one place you want to yeah. go first, um, first of all, I think just just to be sure, let, let let's make it clear for the audience what consciousness is, because a lot of sure. times right, right, consciousness right. can mean a lot of different things for different people, right? Uh, so it's important to 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 try to define it, and and. So I go with the canonical definition these days it's from Thomas Nagel from 74. He has this pivotal uh, uh, paper, what is it like to be a bet? Uh, and over there, he, uh, he defined consciousness as if there is something that is like uh, to be the creature. Or, so so let's, let's say that when you see an apple, uh, there is something that is like for you to see that, that apple. You will you, you will see uh, that this apple is red, and maybe you will take it and you will taste it and you will uh, mm -hmm. love the taste, right? So there is something that is like for you. While we awake, while we have consciousness, there is something that is like for us to sense the world, to think, to feel. Um, and then let's say that now we, uh, you. Uh, you went to sleep and you're in deep sleep and no dreams and actually for for you you will not have any consciousness uh, it will for you it will uh, go just like that like uh, right and all of a sudden you will wake up and your consciousness will come back so on this duration of deep sleep you will have no nothing that is like um it's and that's so so this is more or less the definition of mm -hmm. consciousness to have the um uh yeah uh, to have something that is like to sense the world and to think and to feel uh to have experiences i would say you know uh, mm -hmm. experience of the outside world and the inner world right so this is very um important it means even that you know, other other animals can have consciousness if they have something that is like. And it means that it, it's not about the self. It, it, even if you if even if there is an animal that doesn't have any concept of I of self, sure. but still, if she has something that is like to sense the world, then this creature has consciousness, for example. Right? So it's a very basic um property, let's call it. And it's different than intelli intelligence, on the other hand. So sure, a lot of people, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you for, for setting the stage there. I think, uh, yeah, I kind of go in sometimes. And I'm like, oh, yeah, everyone knows what, everyone has got the same definition. It's like, no, they do not. So, so what it's like to be something is, is kind of the most kind of concise way to uh, just grab a consciousness as well. Great. Um, yes, exactly. So great. From there, would you like to then, I guess, go into the the equivalence principle that you br you brought in and how that relates to uh, what relativity that you spoke about? Yes, let's start uh, from the equivalence principle that Einstein did. So mm -hmm. uh, between a, a special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity in 1909, I think Einstein had a very interesting insight on, on the way, before we understood that, uh, uh, that, that gravity is actually curvature of space-time before that, first of all, he realized that we cannot distinguish between system, systems that are under acceleration and systems that are under gravitational field. Um, it's interesting when you think about it because we spoke couple of minutes ago, that acceleration is an absolute phenomenon, right? But now Einstein actually showed us that it's not entirely true. That actually, um, also about acceleration, there is some kind of relativity here. You cannot distinguish if you are under acceleration or actually if you are under gravitational field. So, okay, let, let mm. me give you an example. 
let's take two astronauts in two different spaceships. Now, one spaceship is here on Earth, and the other spaceship is out in out of space, far away from every star and planet, so no gravity over there. But this spaceship is accelerating. So, and now the astronauts inside the spaceships are conducting some experiments. Again, they take a ball and release the ball from the, their hands. Okay, now the spaceship here under gravity, uh, I, of course, that when the astronaut will release the ball, it, the ball will just um, fall uh, to the floor, right? Because of gravity. But now let's think about the spaceship uh, in the under acceleration over there. So the astronaut again will release the ball. And again, because now all the spaceship is accelerating, let's say it's accelerating upwards or like, you know, towards the ceiling, <laughs> then what uh, the astronaut will measure is that the ball, it should float, right? But from her point of view, the ball actually uh, uh, goes down towards, towards the, the floor. So she will say um, that actually she's not under acceleration, but uh, under gravitational fields. And this is, this is true because under gravitational field, you know, I don't know if you remember this free falling uh, uh, law, let's call it, but everything falls on the same rate. Uh, it doesn't matter how uh, massive it is, uh, still uh, everything, like you take a small, I don't know, a feather or something, and you take an iron ball or something, right? Both of them will fall on the same rate together. So everything falls at uh, the, the, same, the same rate in, uh, under gravitational field. And this is exactly what she will measure also under acceleration. Everything, uh, let's say from the outside, we will see that everything just floats, but from her point of view, she will see that everything everything falls together uh, towards the uh, the floor of, of the spaceship, just because the spaceship is accelerating upwards, right? So Einstein realized here that there is a relativistic uh, um, there is a, a, some relativity here between uh, um, gravity and acceleration, and he called it the uh, equivalence principle. Uh, and it means now that we have here two systems. The two observers cannot distinguish. They have the same exact uh, measurements and results. And because of that, they have they are equivalent. They have the same physical laws and same phenomena. And then he actually did the prediction. And the prediction was that uh, they knew about the redshift effect of light uh, under acceleration. And he said that the same phenomenon should occur also under gravity, uh, just because of this equivalent principle, right? If 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 they are two, those two systems are equivalent, then the same phenomenon that we see of uh, of light becoming more red, right? The uh, the frequency goes down because of acceleration. We need to see the same phenomenon also happening uh, under gravity. If it, if it will not be the same, then we can distinguish between them. And then the, you know, and then it means that the equivalence principle is wrong. So if the equivalence principle is correct, we also should find a redshift uh, effect also under gravity. And then after, I think, 50 years or something like that, I think in the 50s or in the 60s, um, they did the first experiments to check if there is a redshift effect of light here on Earth, uh, and they saw that uh, Einstein was right. There is a redshift effect uh, because of gravity and um, the equivalence principle holds. Okay, so this is the equivalence principle that Einstein did. Now we can try to take it into consciousness. It start the starting point. I would say is the hard problem of consciousness that we the, the, the mystery core of, of uh, consciousness 
the, the reason that I started to in, um, investigate it to begin with. And so the hard problem is the fact that we cannot find our experiences. What is it like? This part of these experiences, we cannot find it in the brain anywhere. We, in the brain, we can only see neural patterns. We call it a third person point of view. From the third person point of view, when I look at your brain, the only thing I will see is just the dynamics of your neurons. And let's say that I'm in the future even, and I have the most sophisticated uh, technologies. Um, and I can describe exactly what is going on in your brain. I will not find the actual experience that you have. Let's say that you feel happiness or something like that. I will not find your happiness. I will just find some neural patterns. Uh, and I will see that those patterns represent your happiness. Because every time I, I need to ask you, what do you feel? And only then you will tell me, oh, I feel happiness right now. And then I will see this pattern. And this pattern will, will always occur when you, when you feel happiness. So I know that it represents happiness, but it's not the actual experience, just because mm -hmm. if it was the actual, I mean, a lot of people say, why not? Why, why not? Maybe this neural pattern is just happiness. But it cannot be, right? Because if it was happiness, then when I would measure it, uh, I will actually measure your happiness. And I'm not, I just can measure these neural patterns. I need to ask you what it is, right? So mm -hmm. it cannot be the same thing. Uh, and because of that, uh, we cannot find the experience anywhere. And it's pretty weird, right? The brain, this is where experience should occur. The brain should create our experiences. So how come we cannot find it there? We don't have any physical or neurological explanation or description for how the brain creates our experiences, right? So this is the hard problem. Another name for it is the um, uh, explanatory gap, because there is a gap here between the third person point of view, the neural patterns, and the first person point of view, the actual experiences that you um, measure, right? So. Yeah. We say that it's private, uh, yeah. and um, we don't know of any physical property that it, that is private. In that sense, that you, only you can measure it. You know what is going on here, right? So, okay. So yeah, now, answer, just a random question: what, Which uh, yeah. which term do you prefer? Do you prefer the hard problem, or do you prefer calling it the explanatory gap? Ooh, huh. I think the explanatory gap. Actually, I prefer yeah, the gap. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'm I'm a gap guy. I you are a gap guy. <laughs> <laughs> Two gap guys. Just uh, exactly. yeah. uh, I think it just I think it's a better term because the hard problem it gets kind of fuzzy. People mm -hmm. yeah, but explanatory gap, that's it's the heart of the of the issues. Just it's random more aside. It's yeah, more, it's I think it is. I think it is. People have different preferences probably, but uh right. it's more intuitive, I, I think. For too. me as well. It's it's intuitive. Ah yeah, there is a gap between the third and the first. Points of view, of yeah, course, right. you know, it's, yeah. Because you hear people sometimes, and maybe we'll talk about it too, is sometimes some folks say that there is no hard problem. And then it's like, mm -hmm. do you mean that it's not a, it's not a difficult problem? Or do you, do you mean that there's no, like, but if you say there's no gap, oh, maybe you have to actually run into the same linguistic problem there. I don't know. <laughs> That's a no, because, aside, but yeah. I think you're right, because if yeah. you say there's no gap, then I will ask you immediately, how come, what, how do you bridge the gap? Planet, yeah. And if you say there is no hard problem, okay, so it's not exactly clear what to ask next, you know. Mm -hmm. But here, so f in order to say that there is no gap, you need to show how you how do you bridge it, right? And this is, of course, soon we will speak. Uh, how do I try to bridge it in the right, right, relativistic right, right. approach? But first of all, zombies. <laughs> zombies. So now, after we <laughs> after we know what is the what is this gap? What is the the gap is all about? Chalmers took this gap and, you know, Chalmers, he's the one that make this phrase, the hard problem. I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need to tell, to, to tell him, you know, it, it's, <laughs> the gap is better. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, he, he continues and he, what he said is that it seems that consciousness, because of this gap, 
Consciousness is independent of any explanation, not only even neuroscience explanation, but any physical explanation. Because any physical explanation would be something like, we have a process, we have an emergence or whatever, a complex process, emergence, something like that. And this emergence now is consciousness. But then it's again, it's a problem because I can measure this process, this physical process, this physical emergence, or, and I will not measure your happiness. I will just measure a process. So again, we have a gap. So it seems that we have a gap just between consciousness and any physical uh, explanation. And so Chalmers, Chalmers said, uh, well, we have here, so it means actually that consciousness is just in the, uh, independent of any physical explanation. And because of that, maybe there are creatures that are exactly the same as us physically. So same body, same brain, same representation, same neural patterns, same dynamics, they will say the same thing like you. When, when, when I give them an apple, let's say that we have your uh, zombie twin and I give you and the, your zombie twin the same apple, yep. you will say the same things. You will say, oh, yeah. this is a nice apple, you know, and, uh, and we will, I will see even the same representations in your brain. But because consciousness uh, is, in, is independent, uh, of, any, of, of your brain and any physical aspect, then let's assume that those zombies doesn't have consciousness at all. And Is a zombie like a clone of me, like an exact replica yeah. to, yes. the, to, the neuron, to the cell? Like to the cell, okay. even to the electron, I would say. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is this the, what you're putting up here? I mean... You're saying the zombie wouldn't have consciousness. Yeah, it's, or that's what you, I, no, that's what people no. usually say. That's what Chalmers said. I think that's what yeah. Chalmers argues. Yeah. So Ch Chalmers, Chalmers will say, let's assume that. Oh no, he will say we can think about a creature like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's plausible that this creature can exist. And why is it plausible? Because we see that consciousness is independent, independent of physics. So it's it's plausible that there is, you know, there is a possibility of such a creature that will be with the same physics like us, but with no consciousness. Why is consciousness independent of physics? Because of the gap. Because physics cannot explain consciousness. But just because okay. it doesn't seem... Hmm. Just because we can't explain it doesn't mean it's independent, right? It depends. What do you mean? Uh, why? Well, usually, when we, if we can explain the physical um, process that creates something, mm -hmm. we did a reduction, right? Now we don't need this something, right? We take a temperature. And now we say, we don't need temperature. Actually, we know the temperature are just those particles that, that, uh, that are moving and bumping each other. So now temperature, we did a reduction here. We don't need temperature anymore. It, it can be interesting to, it, it can be more easily described with temperature, but we don't really need it. We can, uh, we can speak about those particles. So same thing can, uh, same thing, could, could be with consciousness. If we can have any explanation for consciousness, uh, then we can explain it with this physical process and we don't need consciousness anymore. Uh, and uh, so there is, so now consciousness depends on this process, right? Depends on this explanation. But because there is no, it, it seems that there is no explanation there because of the gap. Because of that, consciousness seems to be independent of any physical process, of any reduction point of view, and it's something different, not not physical. And because of that, we can think about the same physics and still a creature yeah. that will have no consciousness, according to Chalmers. Yeah. 
I have Cosmo Williams yeah. right to show that it's not the case, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I but guess I guess the... I guess I have other issues with Chalmers is with with the way with the way this is it just seems like and to say it's independent is to say it seems independent. We we could just be our science could just be behind on XYZ mechanism, but but your paper goes anyway to yeah for well, like the just, idea of zombies so i think it makes sense if, if you want to jump into your into your side of the of how it comes right. into your paper it's fine yeah. yeah i would just <laughs> add that according to chalmers i think so he thinks that we need a new kind of physics so to, to add something into physics to add mm. the some phenomenal aspects mm. somehow he doesn't know mm. how to do it but yeah yeah this is okay. his intuition like that yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. I, have to, I have to read more of his work, to be honest. So. Yeah, or maybe yeah. even a panpsychism that somehow <laughs> in physics, again, we need to add sla- a- another aspect, the, this aspect of phenomenal consciousness or something like that. And, and, and then maybe this addition to physics can, uh, uh, will be the explanation. But, but again, it's addition. It's not, it's not like the, our usual physics. Uh, yeah. Or yeah. something like that but yeah he doesn't have any any good theory of course it just he he showed us the depth of the mystery and it's very important right first of all it's yeah. important to understand that there is a mystery here right yeah and, and then we can try to think if we can actually somehow can bridge it <laughs> gotcha so you prove in the paper that this philosophical zombie would have to have consciousness right right uh, in- how do you do that Okay, in order to prove it, we need an assumption. And the assumption is the relativistic principle. So I assume that consciousness is a relativistic phenomenon, right? It depends now on the measurements in, in, of the observer in the frame of reference. Um, just to be clear here, what is a, a measurement? A measurement, it's not what we think, like you, you go to the lab and you take uh, some measurement device. A measurement in physics, it's every or any uh, interaction. Any interaction is a measurement. Sure. And any, anything can be an observer in physics. So a particle, like let's say an a electron that uh, goes inside magnetic field, those they have a measurement there uh, mm-hmm. or an interaction between them. Yeah. This is the measurement and because of that now, for example, we will see a spin, right? The superposition will collapse, right? So, okay, so a measurement is just another name for interaction. So this is, you know, this is important to understand uh, uh, what, you know, what, what uh, uh, am I talking about here? Okay, so, okay, so consciousness, um, so there's nothing more, uh, nothing above and beyond the observers, right? About consciousness now. Uh, and now we can take two observers. Uh, let's say you will be one observer, and the other one will be your uh, zombie twin. Mm-hmm. So first of all, in order to speak about consciousness as a relativistic phenomenon, we need to uh, understand what are the frames of reference that are relevant for consciousness. Because when we spoke about velocity or gravity or acceleration over there it's obvious what are the frames of reference it's just different positions in space and time but here now what exactly are we talking about with consciousness so we defined in the paper and i have to say by the way it's we it's not only me because i i it's a collaboration i, I wrote the paper with a, a philosopher with a zakaria nime he's um he finished his uh, PhD in uh, Memphis University, and we, you know, I took him and I told him, well, I, I have this uh, theory, but you know, I'm not sure that all the philosophical moves are they good or not. So, you know, let's come, uh, let, let's uh, write it together, right? So we defined over there um, a cognitive frame of reference, and a cognitive frame of reference means that you have a cognitive system now, and the cognitive system has some dynamics. Uh, and this dynamics, now this is what defines this cognitive frame of reference. So if we do it a bit more you know, rigorously, 
Um, a cognitive system means that you have a system that can learn, has memory, and after it learns, also it can create representations of what it learns. Um, and it represent the world, the world outside. And if it's complex enough, it can represent its own uh, uh, system or state. So now it has some dynamics of those representations. Our brain is another, of course, cognitive system with some neural representations. So you have your own dynamics, and that's why you have your own cognitive frame of reference. And I, and I have a different cognitive frame of reference with, with a different dynamics, okay? So now this is what we are talking about. So now the space, if you like, that we are talking about is the state space of a cognitive system. And we can, uh, and, uh, and, and again, according to the relativistic principle, it's all equivalent. Your cognitive frame of reference should be equivalent to my cognitive frame of reference. So we can do a transformation here between your cognitive frame of reference into mine, for example. Okay? There is the, uh, because they are all the same. There's no, we cannot privilege one cognitive frame of reference, okay? Uh, so this is the, the idea here. So we do like a transformation, if you like, from your um, state space, uh, the uh, into my uh, uh, state space, the state space of uh, state space of my brain. Let's call it. Okay. So this is. So now we have again. It's a bit technical, maybe, but some definition to start with. Okay. Uh, so now let's go back to you and your zombie twin. We have uh, both of you. And now you can create some uh, experiments in, in your different cognitive frames of reference. You, um, so let, let's say that I give you and your zombie this, uh, uh, an apple, right? So you will have a, an experience of this apple and you will say, I see this apple, it looks good, it's red, it's round. But then the zombie will say the same thing, right? He will have the exact same reports as you. Um, and then we can check your brain and we will see that you have the same brain, the same di dynamics, the same representation of the redness or representation sure. of the roundness of the apple. So everything will be just the same between you and your zombie twin. So according to the relativistic principle then, we that we assume, according to, to it, we cannot distinguish. I mean, because we cannot distinguish between you and your zombie, then you are, um, there is an equivalence between you and your zombie. You, and uh, it means that you have the same physical laws and all the phenomena that you have, also the zombie will have. So if you have consciousness, then the zombie must have consciousness as well. If not, if, it's, if it wasn't the case, if somehow you have consciousness, but the zombie doesn't have it, then it means that uh, the relativistic principle will break because now we can distinguish between uh, uh, you and your zombie. So according for the relativistic principle to hold, both of you has, has to have consciousness, right? Uh, the zombie also must have consciousness, okay? So if you assume the relativistic principle, uh, we see that zombies cannot exist uh, um, and they must, because they must have consciousness as well. Um, we can go a bit deeper in that, but I'm not sure that we need actually. And you know, Chalmers goes even deeper than that mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the zombie argument, but maybe it's, I, I'm not sure that we need to go uh, more than that, you know, but, uh, uh, if you like, you can, but uh, this is more or less, you know, the how I try to show that zombies uh, cannot exist. Right. I mean, that there wouldn't be zombies, that they would be yeah. something else. The, yeah. They the would be. Back, the is. Yeah, they would be the same like you. You and, this, and your zombie actually are in the same cognitive frame of reference. Mm -hmm. Just like, uh, let's say that uh, you see me in the train and my train moves. 
If you want to change your frame of reference, you can do it. You can um, uh, start to run or something at the same velocity as I do, right, in the train, and then uh, we'll be in the same cognitive, uh, in the same frame of reference. Sorry. So in this, the same thing happens here as well. If you will change your, uh, if I mean, because your brain and the zombie brain are the same, you have the same dynamics actually. So you are in the same cognitive frame of reference, even. Right. Uh, so, um, and then when you have consciousness, also your zombie will have consciousness. Gotcha. So now we can ask, what is consciousness then in the zombie mm -hmm. frame of reference? Right. We thought that it that it has only neural patterns, but now all of a sudden we see that it has more than that. Mm -hmm. So where is it? What is it exactly? Yeah. Uh, and the, according to the theory, again, there is an equivalence here between something that we call uh, in phenomenal judgments uh, uh, and, and, and consciousness. So what is phenomenal judgment? It's something, again, something that Chalmers uses. So Chalmers li uh, um, likes this phenomenal judgment thing, it, it means that we create judgments about phenomenality, about things in the world. When you see the apple and you will say, this apple looks tasty, this is a phenomenal judgment. It's about something, about the world, about yourself. When you say, I feel happiness, or I have consciousness, those also phenomenal judgments. So you have in your brain, you create some representations of those phenomenal, phenomenal judgments. You have a representation about the redness of the apple, about the fact that the apple looks tasty, or a representation about, uh, a, I don't know, your happiness. So those phenomenal judgments and those representations they are not consciousness. They are not the experience itself. They are exactly what, what we called before neural patterns. Those are mm -hmm. just the patterns, just the representations, right? But they, you, you see that always they accompany the actual experience. Every time that you will say that you feel happiness, I will always see the same neural representation let's say. So they always come together. And, um, you know, uh, we develop the mathematics and we show that because of this equivalence between the zombie and you, in the end, what we show is that there is an equivalence between those um, phenomenal judgment representation, those neural patterns, and between the actual experiences. And it makes sense when you think about it. You cannot distinguish between them because they always come together. So again, because of the relativistic principle, if you cannot distinguish between two things, then actually they are the same thing, right? So, uh, so, so actually now um, a special kind of neural patterns, a kind that we call it phenomenal judgment representations, those are equivalent to um, phenomenal consciousness or qualia or consciousness or experience, all those names more or less means the same thing. So there is an equivalence here between those two, uh, two things. But this equivalence, what it means is it's not that they are the same. It means that it, it depends where, in which cognitive frame of reference you are in. What are the measurements that you can create? You know, so in when you when we when I look at your brain, the kind of measurement that I can do will show me uh, those neural patterns, those phenomenal judgment representations. Mm -hmm. But from your from the inside, from your own cognitive system, from your own cognitive frame of reference, you have different measurements, and because of them, what you measure actually is um, consciousness or the actual experience. They, in that sense, they are equivalent to each other. It's like two 
uh, different descriptions of the, of the same underlying reality. It's two different physical properties, but both of them are of the same underlying reality. Uh, but because everything is, is uh, relative now, it's all about the observers. So that's why we cannot see this underlying reality. The, the, the only thing that we can do are those measurements and we can either measure neural patterns or, uh, or uh, uh, the experience. We cannot measure both. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit like a coin. When yeah. we look at the coin, we see either head or tail. It depends on the point of view, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing here. Depends on the point of view of the measurements, we see either experiences or uh, just neural patterns, either third person point of view or first person point of view, but not at once, not together. Right, yeah, because the zombie, we have two separate conscious experiences, but where yeah. it matters is our frame of reference. So within our, within our brains, we're looking out to the world, we're having it filtered through and it's, it's separate, but it is equivalent. Um, yes, exactly. So, yeah. So I guess I'm wondering, like, why do you think um, the theory of relativity has been around for a long time, or like the, not just Einstein's, but the relativistic concept in physics has been around for a long time. Why do you think it's taken, and the hard problem has been around for, well, as, <laughs> as phrased as, as a hard problem has been around for, you know, since 1996 or so, I think it was like the nineties or eighties that it was coined. Yeah. Why do you think it's taken so long for people to, for someone to bring these concepts together? Like it does seem, as you as you lay it out, it does seem, you know, rather straightforward. It's like, oh, of course, mm -hmm. that is the way it is, right? Well, how else could it be? I guess right. is is there a reason? Can you run us through why? Um, yeah, I guess yeah. some of the good... like what like uh, what, 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 why do you think that is? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. But by the way, yeah, so Chalmers wrote it in ninety six. But in the 80s already, they spoke about the um, gap, the explanatory yeah, gap. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm sure it's been discussed and, for thousands oh, of years. Yeah. You know, that question is yeah. but yeah. For sure, but, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Um, I think we people didn't think about it before because we are stuck in concepts, you know, in, in the uh, paradigm. Uh, and our paradigm is that what we see is absolute or that um, physical properties should be absolute. Mm -hmm. That's why also with quantum mechanics, it's so hard for us. Uh, things are so <sighs> relative there and not absolute, you know, it's good for us. Or even to think about time um, as a, a not absolute, but something that People will measure differently. If you are ne uh, next to a black hole, time will, will be completely uh, uh, different. And here, it's very weird for us right? because we used to think in an absolute terms, you know, absolute way of thinking. Um, and because of that, I, maybe, it was hard for, for us to think um, that if we, you, if we change this one assumption, all of a sudden, the hard problem will dissolve very naturally, right? I mean, now that we bridged the gap, there is no gap anymore. Um, Wait, how's the gap? I mean, the gap, I, I think of it is explaining how the phenomenon comes to be. I think, um, so how does your, how does this theory dissolve that question? Okay, right. So two things. First of all, we see now that we don't need, so what was the gap? That we see neural patterns, or let's say even those phenomenal judgment representations, but we cannot find the actual uh, experience, right? And we cannot, so we don't know what is the process, the physical process that can create uh, those experiences. But now we see that we don't need the physical process uh, or we don't need calculations in the brain that will create consciousness. It's not about the calculations now. It's a, now it's about a, a physical process of measurement, right? How measurements uh, manifest new physical properties. Um, 
So first of all, now we see that it's just, we have just an equivalence here, right? two different point of views that describe the same underlying reality, right? So we don't need, so now it's not that, that uh, um, neural patterns create consciousness. They are just equivalent to consciousness, okay? So this is the first, first step in order to bridge the gap. Yeah. Uh, the second uh, step is to, uh, is to realize the relational part here. Um, let me, let, let's go back for a minute for the equivalence principle of Einstein, the equivalence between the acceleration and, and uh, gravity. So the observer under acceleration, she will say that she has no acceleration, but she has gravity, right? So in her frame of reference, from her you know, relations that she measured, she has a, a new physical property. She has a physical force, gravitation, right? From the outside, we will not see it. From the outside, we will measure that she has no gravity. She is just under acceleration. And because of that, we can explain whatever going on in, in her measurements. But for her, she will measure a completely different thing, a different physical property, a force, a, a gravitational force. So, um, so we see here, this is a very nice example how measurements, how the relations manifest different physical properties. And it's all equivalent, right? You can, you can say that it's only acceleration and you will be right. And you can say, no, it's actually a force, a gravitational force. You will also will be right, okay? It's all equivalent. Um, and the same thing happens here. From the outside, we will say that we have neural patterns. And from the inside, we will say that we have a new physical property, uh, this phenomenal consciousness, this experience. And we are also right. Um, and, now, and now look what is going on here. You know, there is a lot of people, there are lots of people actually, that say um, consciousness is just an illusion. Their mistake is to privilege the uh, third person point of view, to privilege the <clears throat> those neural patterns. It's like the, the it's like the other astronaut from the outside. Um, he will say you only have acceleration. You are uh, delusional. You don't have gravity, but it's wrong. It's not the case, right? Gravity is just you know, from a different point of view, she's right. It's not wrong. They are equivalent. So it's the same here. It's wrong to say we don't have any consciousness. It's just an illusion. It's not true. It's, there is an equivalence here. Just different uh, uh, frame of reference and different measurements, different relations that manifest different physical properties. So the whole point now is to understand what are those different measurements? How come? From the outside, we can we will um, we have one kind of measurement that will manifest uh, neural patterns, and from the inside of the cognitive system, we have a different kind of measurement that will manifest a, a phenomenal consciousness. So, what is going on here? Why do we have those two different uh, manifestations? The so the difference in the measurement is that from the outside, what we can do, we measure it with our sensory devices, like our eyes, our ears. You know, if you really want, you can somehow try to measure with your tongue. I don't know, you know. Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> we. Uh, so let's let's continue with the eyes. So we have some measurements here. We have some interactions, right? The light comes from your brain into my eyes, to the retina. And that's how I can measure what I see, the outside world. So this kind of measurement can manifest the physical substrate 
uh, of your neurons. That's why we, this is what we see. We see your neurons and the dynamics of the neurons. But now let's switch, let's transform, if you like, to your own cognitive frame of reference. Now you, you create in your brain all those phenomenal judgment representations and you need to measure them. You need to interact with them. But what is this interaction exactly? I mean, it's not the interaction that we do with our eyes, right? We don't have any sensory devices inside our brain. Uh, we, we do something completely different inside. So the kind of interaction that we can do is just to compare, to do, to check the relations between one neural patterns to others between this phenomenal judgment representation of the apple to other maybe representations of the apple that you learned before, or maybe other representations of other fruits. Okay, so we create all those relations and we check those relations. This is the kind of measurement that we do in our brain. So it's a completely different measurement than what we can do from the outside, right? And because it's so radically different, the physical property that uh, is manifested is also radically different. So because of that, for this, let's say, radically different physical property, we, we, call, we call it consciousness or experiences, qualia and so on. So that's why we have two different um, frames of reference, the third person uh, frame of reference and the first person frame of reference. And that's why they are so different, but still equivalent. Exactly like, you know, um, is it acceleration or gravity? So here is it uh, neural patterns or consciousness. So this is how uh, the relativistic approach a bridge the the gap. It's all about um, equivalences and all about the physical process of measurement and manifestation of new properties. Interesting. And besides being uh, you know, one of the most chosen as one of the most influential papers of the year by the uh, yeah. Science News, um, which congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, thank what's you. Been, thank you. What's been the response to the paper beyond that? Slowly but surely, you know, so now it's, it's the new kid on the block. There are lots of different um, theories of consciousness mm -hmm. and no theory knows how to bridge the gap. Uh, I think, you know, not even IIT or something like that. Uh, and uh, now, you know, I come with a new theory. So I need to convince the, um, my peers that actually they should notice <laughs> to this new theory, right? So the last last year, I mean, now it's more or less one year after I published the theory. And in this year, I try to go to all of the big, <clears throat> uh, the big conferences about consciousness and do lots of lectures about it in different labs that uh, uh, of researchers that research, that do research about consciousness. And I, I have a, a very good, a very positive uh, reactions, uh, but it takes time. You know, it takes time in order to grasp the deep, you know, what exactly this, uh, the relativistic approach uh, means. I, I can tell you that one, uh, one researcher, I spent with him five meetings, something like five hours. And in the end, he told me, wow, you know what? All of the other theories, they just models, but you, you are the only one that actually um, have a theory to explain consciousness. So, you know, so, so it takes time, but I have a very good, um, a very positive reactions. Um, but now what I need to do is to show, to show some, uh, empirical evidence that the theory is is um, you know is is a good theory, 
Um, so the, let's say that I have a couple of common questions about the theory. And one of the common questions is, okay, how can you validate the theory, sure. right? Because, and especially in neuroscience, it's a field that is very experimental field. It's amazing. I mean, in physics, of course, in science, it's, uh, we need experiments. So we will know if something is correct or not. But in physics, at least, we have theoretical physics and not only experimental physics. Uh, and here in, in neuroscience, it's completely different. It's really hard to do theoretical neuroscience. This is what I discover now. <laughs> sure, right. So everybody now wants me to jump into the experiments very quickly. And not, um, I don't have the luxury of like uh, in string theory that, you know, they like 20, 30 years now, they, they try to uh, develop the mathematics and try to yeah. see what it means. Here, no, they, I, I need to dive into the experiments. So this is now what I try. I will try to do actually. In, in my postdoc, I will try to. Uh, I have. Um, I have um, a, an idea for a prediction, and then how to, you know, how to uh, check it in an experiment. So this would be the next uh, stage. The next yeah. step. Can you give us an example? You sh share what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, the idea here is that, as we saw, it's all about the measurement. Um, so first of all, I need to define exactly what are the minimal conditions in order to have consciousness. Because, OK, so in this paper, I just showed how the relativistic approach can uh, um, explain or uh, fill the gap. But I didn't, and I, I took humans, which we know that we have consciousness, and zombies, uh, which we know that they, they are uh, uh, an exact replica. Um, but now, and then, and then it was easy for me. I could use those uh, uh, phenomenal judgment representations that we have. And they uh, uh, always uh, accompany the actual experiences. But what would happen now if we will go into different animals or GPT or whatever? Sure. I need, we need to understand what exactly are the minimal conditions for those measurements that manifest consciousness. And then, I, we can do a couple of things. If we, if when, if we have these minimal conditions, then uh, we can check which animals have consciousness, or which AI uh, systems will have consciousness, and or babies, the uh, human babies, do they have consciousness to begin with? When uh, will it appear? Lots of questions, right? Uh, so this is one thing that we can do. And the other thing is that is uh, to make a prediction here. If I know what are the minimal conditions, then the prediction will be that when we awake, when we have a conscious state, we should see those minimal conditions um, at work or active in our brains. And when we are unconscious, like when we are in deep sleep with no dreams or under anesthesia, then we should see that all those minimal conditions will not uh, be active, right? If they will be active and still you have no consciousness, then it's a problem for the theory, right? So, so this is a good uh, prediction uh, in order to falsify the theory. So, um, so it seems that those minimal conditions uh, are the fact that First of all, we need an interaction because a measurement is an interaction. So we need an interaction. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, what kind of interaction, right? Uh, this is the question now. And uh, this is exactly the kind that uh, we spoke before that we check all the relations between the input 
let's say that you see the apple, so um, a representation of this apple, and other representations that are relevant to other apples or other fruits. Mm -hmm. So we need an interaction that takes into account all those relations all at once. In order to do that, uh, there is actually some structures or mental structures that people are talking about in cognitive science. Uh, they call it cognitive spaces, cognitive uh, maps. Um, and the idea here is uh, that um, the brain creates a new space, if you like, yeah. a new coordinate system. Uh, and each of those axes in this new coordinate system is a, a relevant feature, a dominant feature. So for example, let's say that you see the apple. So according to those ideas of cognitive spaces, the brain at some point in a higher level uh, cognition, uh, it will create a space with uh, one coordinate in this space can be the shape. Another one, the, uh, uh, the color. A third one, the taste. And then each representation now will, will have some values inside this space. So, uh, so when you'll see the apple, the apple will, will be inside this space somewhere, but then different apples will be nearby because they will have similar uh, features, right? But a banana will have a different, uh, quite different features. Um, so it will be further away in this space. So now we have a space that captures all the dominant structures and all the, the input and the relevant um, representations and all the relations all at once. All those relations now are according to the distances between them. Okay, so now if we have an interaction, if we have one area in the brain that can interact with this map, with this another area in the brain that creates this map. So if it can interact with it, you know, and then uh, you can put the uh, uh, input there and you can check all the, those distances, then according to the theory, this is the kind of measurement that will manifest consciousness. So, okay, so now wh what I just explained, this is mo more, most likely this will be the minimal conditions, but I, it's still under, you know, development, sure. right? It's the, this is the All next right. paper. Uh, but then if it's true, if this is uh, in the end, if this will be correct, then uh, now uh, I, I have a prediction here. Uh, that every time that we have a conscious state, we will see the activation of a cognitive space. And every time that we are unconscious, then we should find no activation of any uh, um, uh, mental space at all. So I now uh, I spoke with um, Professor Tristan Beckenstein from Cambridge University. And he is exactly uh, on, he's doing this experiment exactly between consciousness and sleep and awake. He, 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 he takes um, people and gives them a task, some cognitive, at the cognitive task. Why they, are, and they like, you know, they, they sit comf comf comfortably in a room, in a dark room, their eyes are closed. And in the end of the day, they will just, they will start to do this task, but in the end they will fall asleep. Yeah. So this is exactly what they need. So I spoke with him and we want to do those experiments together. And then we can compare what happens while you uh, awake and do this task and have consciousness. And then when you <laughs> fell asleep into deep sleep, let's say, and have no consciousness, Later on, we can do another experiment of the difference between deep sleep and dreams, because in a dream you have consciousness, right? You still have something that is like, you can run in the dream and everything, right? Yeah. So again, we can validate the theory between uh, deep sleep and dreams, for example. 
So all that, this is this is what we want to do <laughs> together now. Very interesting. Cool. Well, well, we'll have to keep an eye out for uh, for that research and the experiments. And I know we're a bit over time here, but I'd love to. Uh, I know you, in our email exchange, you had mentioned um, maybe uh, that you were getting funds for uh, trying to apply for grants, and also an interesting way of uh, perhaps like crowdsourcing uh, funding as well. If you want to mention that. Yes, yes. Uh, because in neuroscience, uh, it's um, it's not like in theoretical physics. It seems <laughs> it's hard to get fund for consciousness. Consciousness studies, although now it's part of neuroscience and cognitive science, still it, it's on the edge. It's hard to get funds for uh, consciousness studies, and even more so, it's hard to get funds for new theories. It's like too much outside of the box. I realized that, you know, we tried to, of course, to submit some grants and we realized that it's very, um, how to call it? They, they give money for something that they are pretty sure that will work, you know? And a new theory like that, yeah. it's not exactly in, the, in this milieu. So I decided why not to try the new technologies that we have today, like, a, um, like GoFundMe. So I opened the GoFundMe account and uh, everybody that likes that, you know, uh, thinks that this theory is a good theory and likes to help us to fund this, the research that uh, I ju just described, please go. If you can put your put the link in your in the description and oh, well. you know please go and help us uh, fund this uh, all those experiments. Cool, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, I will. That'll be in the description below for for viewers, um, listeners who, who are interested. Absolutely. And uh, I guess on a final note, you know, where can people find out? I mean, there's the GoFundMe. Where 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 else can people find out more about you and your work? Yeah. So first of all, they can uh, read the paper, of course. Yeah, I'll link to that too. That'll be in the description too. Yeah. Right, great. Mm -hmm. And I have also a, a website, uh, lahavnir.com. Okay. Uh, and um, yeah, for now, it's it, it's funny because I really like uh, science communication. I think it's very important to to show people how interesting our reality is. Mm -hmm. And but as you can hear from my accent, I'm not. Uh, from uh, the US or from England, I'm from Israel. So most of my um, uh, science communication, I, I have lots of uh, videos in YouTube and I have a podcast, but still it's in Hebrew. So mm. slowly now I also switch into English and I will start to do that. So yeah, in YouTube, I have um, a channel, uh, The Wonder of Science, and also another channel, uh, Secular Spirituality. Mm. Uh, uh, for now, it's mostly in Hebrew, but slowly I will put there more and more material also in English. So this yeah. is, you know, another thing. And of course, I have a Facebook. I, 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 I for some reason, somehow, I, I really, I have lots of followers in Facebook. So I continue <laughs> to be there and, you know, nice, you can find me there as well, Nir Lahav. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'll link below for folks. I mean, especially if, uh, for folks who understand Hebrew, but... I imagine too. There's probably like auto captions, so there's pro people can probably get captions for your for your work in other languages as well. Um, I know that they auto generate for my videos, but I don't know for right. For well, videos. yeah, I, I I totally forgot, but now I did something for the GoFundMe. Every week, I try to uh, upload a new video that explains um, more and more about the theory. So people can go to the GoFundMe itself. Mm -hmm. And over there, I will have more and more th uh, uh, videos in English, of course, that explain the, all, all of the aspects of the theory. And again, this is another way to... And yeah, the idea is to, to um, upload more and more videos, even when sure. we will start. After we'll have enough funding, we That's will great. start this and I will, I will, uh, uh, <clears throat> I will uh, update people there what is going on and we'll do like zoom meetings and stuff like that oh, nice. so, yeah. very cool I'll keep an eye on it and i just want to say thank you so much dear for your time and your energy today it was really interesting super interesting work 
Um, I recommend folks, viewers, to, to go out and explore more. And uh, just thank, thank you. you so much. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, having me. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.